for about Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine. They eventually kind of join forces and take over the world. Um, so 1990, he forms Interscope, he signs Tupac, and eventually he funds Debt Row Records, which I have yeah. fucking no idea about. 2008, he starts Beats by Dre. He approaches Dr. Dre and says, let's make headphones. Yeah. Um, let's make some savage headphones. Eventually, they start off on the 20% of the world's headphone markets. And then within two years, they have 80% of the world's high end. It was clever because you think your head, these are the headphones that Dr. Dre would use. They definitely aren't. Exactly. The, no, no. The, the, yeah, but the, in your head, you think that, but there's yeah. no, absolutely no way <laughs> in, in a million years. And you get to, the, there's more bass in them. We talked about this. Yeah, because you put bass. batteries in them. That's why. Yeah. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I, like, as much as I, I didn't put Dre on this list because I don't know. If I'm to search my heart's heart, I don't think that Dre is a world class producer. That sounds really? terrible. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, I think that. I think, after, he does, I think he does more for an artist than basic production. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I know what you mean. But I don't think he's world class. Yeah, I don't. I think what he does for himself, he's he's involved in. Let's say six albums that are fucking amazing, and he's composing on them as well. Uh, I, to be honest with you, I think Melman might be the composer on right, that. I, right. That this is why I didn't add him in. I think he might be the guy who goes, I, you know, let's get a little, do a little bloop instead of boom, 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 boom. Yeah. I think that might be his thing. I think he might be an overseer, he's a conductor. Right, yeah, so there's a lot of people composer. that are like that. Yeah, yeah. He, he's he's a big vision kind of guy. Mm. So uh, Ivine, Ivine has worked with. This is a mad fucking list. Kansas, John Lennon, Bruce Springsteen, Patti Smith, Tom Petty, Dire Straits, U2, Simple Minds, The Pretender, Pretenders, Gwen Stefani, Lady Gaga, Iggy Azalea, B.B. King, Meatloaf, Bob Seger, N.E.R.D., Joan Jett, New Kids on the Block, Eurythmics, Rod Stewart, Tracy Chapman. I used to call them the Eurythmics as well. <laughs> yeah, the Eurythmics, yeah. I still can't say Eurythmics. I'm sorry. It's the Eurythmics. <laughs> but someone told me, I was like, I can't delete some of that word. I'm sorry, it's too late. Years, yeah. Don't be saying, go, yeah. don't be giving me stupid words. The Motors, Tracy Chapman, Whitney Houston, Harry Nielsen. Like, the list so is he's, just... he's gone from sort of... Americana to contemporary rock to pop to yeah. folk. He's done a lot. But his roots seem to be, like, where he makes his money seems to be off hip-hop. Oh, yeah. Well, that's where he made If he's got rocks. Interscope, uh, which fought for Nine Inch Nails, which is what who you mentioned with Flood, yeah. <coughs> they signed Nine Inch Nails. They ha- haunted Nine Inch Nails for like three years mm. to get them to sign. Um, IV and did. Uh, eventually got them. But if he's funding Debt Row Records, like it's... Jesus Christ I'm with you um, the song I picked for Jimmy Iovine was, would have been an early one for him I picked Battle of Hell by Meatloaf right he was the producer on this um, this is just one of these songs where uh, I, the nostalgia hurts me when I listen to the song it's like 9 minutes long but it's still so fucking good the only issue with it is it's so low in volume that's like, not necessarily a bad thing. No, not in the, like, the only I, problem I, there is that when you listen to it on a phone I know and you have your headphones or if you stick it on a, a playlist yeah, it's a beast. But if you if you're listening to that on record, where that's fine, everything else the same level, not about yeah, it. Yeah, and it's nice and yeah. warm. You can, get more, you can get more warmth and dynamics from lower, one hundred percent mixed things. I think yeah, one hundred percent. We'll be talking a lot of shit on this podcast, lads. I'm not going to lie to you because we're not producers, but we know enough about it to hopefully. Yeah, but we, at the same time, we've both produced records we were on. Yeah, I mean, I like kind of got boy. Yeah. We, but we've all sat of, there. But I've also worked with producers. Yeah, who exactly. Are just a different ballgame. Exactly. They know exactly what they're doing. And that's not even taking in mix and engineer or the guy who or masters it. Yeah, mastering. That's yeah. where the alchemy comes in, yeah. Yeah, that's where the um, See, fucking. I picked uh, Meat Love, Battle to Hell. Um, I fucking, first of all, I love the song. I love the fact that it's so complicated, yet there's actually not that much going on. <laughs> if you listen to that song, you've got this weird piano. Which is just this roll that's going on forever in yeah. her song. But the guitar is just... Dan, did it, dan, and the drums are just tapping away. Um, the whole thing sounds like it's live. He just found this lovely mix where it does sound like you're actually in a room with Meatloaf playing the song. It doesn't sound like a record. It sounds like you're in a live performance, which is what I like about the kind of Ivan early stuff. And obviously, we sent up the Because the Night. When you listen to Patty Smith, Because the Night, it sounds like you're sitting next to her. You yeah, the to, vocals are yeah. so high, but I'm going to make a bit of a noise here. That's all right. Sorry. Make uh, your sloppy noises. You can, you can, um, I do love the production on that. I love clean production that is also warm. Yeah. So then we have two favorite things. If we're talking about production, um, also, I can't even imagine what some of these producers had to go through. 
I can only imagine like, the shite they had to sit through to actually just, get to something good. The prima donnas, the perfectionists. Pain. Like the first everything I ever got produced was only recently by a proper producer. And I'd say by the end of it, he was like, I fucking hate yeah. this cunt. And it's because it's my first thing getting I produced I never properly. want to hear this again. Yeah. He's probably like, no, just like, he's nitpicking the smallest things. I'm like, but it's, when I go in to make the second one, I won't be anywhere near no, like that. No. Honestly, it's because my first one. And to be fair, like, We've worked with two producers um, on the stuff we're doing at the moment, and they've both been very, uh, very cool with us. But I know for a fact some things I'm niggling that and stuff like. But that's just that's just niggling. But can you imagine but that's a, you? A, yeah, can you imagine a fucking just straight up prima donna arsehole? Well, exactly. Well, who there, takes the piss out of someone's studio? Exactly. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, like, yeah. We'll sit there doing, doing a lot of coke hole. and yeah. fucking this is shit. And you know, what are we doing? Fucking. Here? Yeah, I can only imagine. Mm. Uh, Who's your next one? My next one is a short enough one. This is Jeff Lynn. Jeff Lynne, you'll know from ELO. The, Delicious. The guy from ELO who writes the songs and sings the songs from ELO. Uh, he's an English producer, but he also found, he's a producer as well. Uh, he's, he's well, as well known as a producer as the guy from ELO. Oh, yeah, I think so, yeah. And the Traveling Wilburys, he founded them as well. Yep. Um, I think he's an unreal producer because he produces things to the style, like I've just mentioned. It's spacious, warm, but also I love when people take orchestral stuff without sounding harsh or sharp. Um, to sort of... He, he does back in vocals and harmonies absolutely exactly how I like them. And I can't really describe how I like them. So what I'm trying to say is, if you want to know what the way I like big sounding stuff to produce, just listen to Ticket to the Moon by ELO. And that's exactly what I'm trying to say. And you'll know what I'm talking about. It's warm, it's huge, but it's not over the top. Um, he doesn't have a huge list of stuff he's produced. He's basically done, outside the ELO, I mean, so he's basically done all of the ELO, ELO stuff, a lot of the Traveling Wilburys, some of the people from Traveling mm-hmm. Wilburys, like Roy Orbison and um, George Harrison. He did, uh, in 2015, he did a Brian Adams record, randomly, it stands out, like, in the middle of the thing. His uh, style is this far mic on the drum kit for a mm. big room sort of sound, and yeah. you can tell that he's definitely... Natural echo, like... Yeah, and then he'll squash a lot of the dynamics, and then... Doesn't put he, he's not fond of too much bass as far as mm. I'm aware, um, which you couldn't if you're doing all that stuff. Yeah, something has to go a little bit, something has to hang back a little bit, and I guess that's bass. Um, he's definitely influenced by George Martin and the Beatles, mm. absolutely. But uh, his list isn't massive, and he I have a few of those as well. Yeah, yeah. so but because he's only really gone right. I'm a producer. I want to produce ELO stuff to the best standard. And I absolutely loved production on ELO. So listen to Ticket to the Moon, the, the song I've put up like, there. That, just, that song, like, when I listen to that song, like it's mad spacey. Yeah. And he has this, uh, he has well, that's, these, the, that's the concept of the whole yeah. uh, album. Yeah. And he has this cool Time. kind of a uh, warbling kind of synthesizer, but yeah. he, he knows well enough to bring that synth back in the mix when like the orchestral stuff's going to come in and even then it's still quite loud but yeah. I don't mind it being as, if that's the one bugbear of it is the synth that solo you're talking about mm. it's almost too loud but, it's, but like you said things make room for it and if you listen to that on a record it sounds just like velvet some of these things have to be listened to on incredible headphones to hear yeah. because you're, you don't realise this but your headphones are making their own mix oh yeah exactly but especially if you're listening to Spotify everything's compressed to shit yeah. to be sent even if you've got your bit rate set to the highest uh, yeah. to like extreme bit rate on fucking Spotify it's still nothing like what an original LP or an, yeah. the original mix even the CD sounds like and then you're like we always say you're at the uh, mercy of the weakest link of your sound yes. system so that could be your amp, it could be your record player, yeah, it, could it could be, be the cable speakers. connecting your headphones it to could the be fucking the amp. It could be how you've got them set up, yeah. it could be where you're sitting, and it's just crazy. Yeah. I don't want to get too much into the audio file side of things, but if you listen to this song, you'll know what I mean, but just the sheer warmth of it. Stick some good headphones on, don't listen to it on, as well as that, if you listen to music constantly, mostly on a laptop, don't. Yeah, don't I know put, so many Put a people. few hundred quid into something. I know so speakers. many fucking people that like just listen to music on like, via their laptop speakers. Like, it's, what are you doing? Like Whoa. even MacBooks are great, but they're, they're still, still, still a tiny like, little half-inch speaker. Like oh, it can do nothing. 
you're missing so much yeah. of the music. You're missing yeah. mad shit going on. You're getting on. the like, a layer of the top of it. You're missing all the depth. Like. And that's why I think a lot of people are producing albums dynamically, very loud now and sharp. Yeah. But pierce through oh, into yeah. people's like the loudness minds from the, a speaker. The loudness war started in like the late 90s, early 2000s. And we're starting to kind of settle a little bit where people are getting more into dynamics. Where, um, because I know 80% of people are just walking around with headphones in their phone. So what they're trying, what they're trying to do is they're they're trying to find this, they're they're mixing four headphones on phones. They're not mixing four LPs anymore, um, which is good if that's how you listen to music. But if you're just getting on the bus and you want to hear your favorite song, um, yeah. you're not really doing yourself do you know, any favors. The funny thing is, the vinyl revival. Do you know what hasn't caught up with that yet? The audio foil revival, and I don't yeah. even audio foil. There's people I know. This isn't a, this isn't a dig at anyone doing this mm. because this is a great start. This is how I started. Are buying records before they even have a player. Yeah. That's fine. And then they're buying a kind of smaller player to start off. Yeah. Again, fine. But if you kind of work up to something good and you stick your records on that, you start feeling the music. I don't want to yeah. sound too fucking poncy yeah. about that. But uh, put less money into your buying the new records yeah. and put more money into that system. Into the gear, yeah. I mean. 500 quid will get you a, a decent <laughs> proper good the, the ratio has always been whatever your budget is say your budget is 500 euro or it's 400 euro or 3 or whatever the ratio has always been half the money into your speakers and the rest yeah. of it into everything else Yeah, that's always the ratio your speakers as a rule you'll keep with you forever mm. but you will always upgrade your amp you'll always upgrade your turntable whatever Yeah. Um, but speakers are your biggest fucking worry they're the they're the tires of your car yeah. they're the last thing to hit one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Always spend more money on your speakers than anything else. Don't worry about spending six hundred euro on a record player and fifty quid on speakers. It's not yeah. worth. You're wasting your time. The biggest, yeah, the biggest thing to do is the speakers. Absolutely, speakers. the ones that are giving you the last thing to leave the, the stereo. <laughs> the bit that hits your ear the is the most important. Exactly, one hundred percent. Yeah. So that was Jeff Lynn. Um, yeah. Like I said, it's not a huge amount. Of, I have to put him as one of my favorite producers yep. uh, because because this is exactly how I like things to sound. With, mm-hmm. And I love prog. Like ELO are not the you wouldn't call them prog in terms if you're listening to your top twenty prog yeah. bands, you probably wouldn't be ELO there. But they have a prog approach to certain yeah, things. Elements the there, production yeah. of this, he could have produced some of my favourite prog albums better if he did it like this. So that's him. Who's uh, who's your next one? My next one is Stuart Price, aka Jax Ducant, aka Les Rhythms Digitalis. Oh right, okay. Um, so, Stuart Price born in 1977 in North Yorkshire. Um, his most famous project to the public would be Les Rhythms Digitalis. Yeah. I still... Uh, I, burn burn yeah, burn I've talked about it since the four, very first podcast we ever done. Uh, Dark Dancer, Dark Dancer by Les Rhythms Digitalis is in my top 10 records of all time. Uh, everything about it is perfect. There's not a wasted second. Nothing sounds wrong. Nothing sounds like it should be louder or uh, in the left channel or everything is just perfect about this album it's 80s themed kind of electro music uh that's kind of cheesy he dressed up he kind of dyed his hair red he played guitars for the videos like it was <laughs> the whole thing it was just so over the top um but the album itself is amazing so he released two albums as les rhythms digitalis and then he done a bunch of projects as Jax Ducant, um that were kind of somewhere between production and remixes um, you kind of had a weird fucking, you had a weird kind of system going on. In uh, 2001, he was hired by Madonna to become the musical director for a tour, um, where she wanted to kind of remix all the songs that were going to be on the tour, and um, going from her first releases to her most current releases. But she wanted to do them all a little bit different, mm. so she hired Stuart Price to come on board as a musical director. Um, he done that. He eventually ended up working with Madonna, The Killers, New Order, Kylie Minogue, Missy Elliott, The Pet Shop Boys, Gwen Stefani, Seal, Hard Foy. The, the list is not monstrous, but it's all solid. Um, yeah, the song that you picked, the Pet Shop Boys song, right? Yeah. Uh, has it's off the, the new album. Bombastic sound that Layer and Digital Health. Yeah. So yeah. I picked a song called Will of the Wisp, which is off the latest Pet Shop no, Boys album. I don't like them, but yeah. it's produced well. Yeah. <laughs> this, this song I picked because it has this... Pet Shop Boys seem to be like a, they're like the mosquito and amber, you know, they don't, uh, like, 
Like the, the albums might sound a little bit better, but they're still trapped in time. And I still, to this day, it's 2020, and as much the Pet Shop Boys are fine, I don't hate them, I don't love them, but I don't understand who, like, who goes out of their way to buy a Pet well, Shop Boys album. They are hampered by, first of all, how distinct his voice is. Yes. And that's what turns me off them. And they almost always have to be electronic. Yes. And that's the problem with them. Like, I think Erasure, to put like a comparison in, had more scope. 